what we'll be covering as part of this course. Uh, it is divided into 14 modules. The first one is introduction to blockchain. So we'll see history, uh, why blockchain, the blockchain evolution adoption, what are the current issues in blockchain, uh, and we'll see some success stories, and we'll see why it is you know such a hype technology. Uh, we'll also see cryptocurrency in the blockchain. So what are the transformations in trading units, cryptography, and cryptocurrency, which is underlying, you know, what powers the blockchain, and anonymity and pseudo anonymity, what it is in uh, reference to blockchain. Digital signatures, what are hash codes, why is it important, how is it calculated? We'll see hash pointers and data structures, how the blocks are you know hashed and how it grows into a tree, etc. We'll see blockchain transactions and we will see distributed networks. Next, we'll also see uh, blockchain versus databases. So it is not you know blockchain is not the solution for everything in what situation you should be using a blockchain or in which situations using a relational database still makes sense so we'll see that differentiation uh, so when we start that we'll also uh, for today you know we we won't deep dive into what blockchain is it will be a very high level introduction but when we start with module three uh, we'll get into how blockchain actually uh, operates uh, we'll get into the nitty gritties of it and then I'll make the differentiation on you know how is it different from a database and in what situations in your project when you're, you know when you're faced with a decision whether to use a blockchain based solution or to use a relational database how do you make that decision so we'll be discussing that uh, we'll see what a distributed ledger is and the entire blockchain ecosystem how a particular block looks like the structure of a blockchain and the working of blockchain technology. Uh, blockchain is permission and permissionless. So like having a private, you know, internet or an intranet sort of stuff. So how do you decide for your application whether you want to have a permission blockchain or a permissionless blockchain? Uh, we'll be seeing Bitcoin. Uh, you know how Bitcoin came into existence, why use Bitcoin? Where do you buy Bitcoins? And um, where do you store? So you could store it digitally you could store it on you know hard token how and where can you spend bitcoin how do you sell bitcoins how are bitcoin transactions due and how the transactions work you know how are the transactions written onto the ledger what happens in case of invalid transactions parameters that lead to transactions being invalidated uh, scripting language used in bitcoin application of bitcoin script what are the nodes what is the network in bitcoin and what will you uh, when you join a Bitcoin network, what roles you can play in the Bitcoin ecosystem? We'll see Bitcoin mining. So, what we'll see what mining is, what are the various algorithms used in mining, what are the type of hardware used in mining, and how mining actually works. Uh, Bitcoin mining pools, how cloud mining works. So, in, you know, just having a dedicated hardware, or you could join a pool, or you could uh, become part of a cloud team. Uh, what are mining incentives? So how do you get paid for mining certain blocks? And the security and centralization. Then buying and selling cryptocurrencies. So just like Bitcoin, you have a lot of other currencies. Last I checked, there are more than 1,500 different coins available. Uh, prominent ones uh, would be less than 20. So we'll see them. Uh, we'll see how you store these coins in wallets and other amazing exchanges. What are the various trends in other cryptocurrencies? Then we'll see the problems or you know the need of enhancing the current blockchain. So why did altcoins emerge? Why did forks happen in the existing Bitcoin blockchain? We'll see this. We'll see what contracts are, and we'll see one of the most important. Uh, okay. Uh, Am I audible enough to everyone? Yes. Okay. So we'll as Sunil, actually, as yeah. you see, uh, pretty coming uh, sometime in between. Uh, so I don't know if anybody, anybody else is having the same issue. Yeah, Sunil, there was some okay. uh, static noise again. I mean, as it was uh, previously. Okay. I, oh, I think it's, it's audible. Time. Yeah. yeah, if you face it again, do let me know. 
who are not saying anything so might be yeah i would suggest i would suggest everyone mute their phone except for the trainers i saw ashok giving that message okay so uh, ethereum is one of the other you know important uh, blockchain implementation you have hyperledger you have other such so ethereum is the one that has picked up real big we'll see what ethereum is uh, what is an ether so like on the bitcoin blockchain you have bitcoin on ethereum you have something called as ether how to use ethereum the ethereum ecosystem the d apps or you know dows where you basically uh, auto these are contracts that automatically get executed on a certain condition getting you know fulfilled so we'll see what these are and we'll see how ethereum mining works so it is different from bitcoin mining there are algorithms like some algorithms are called as proof of work some algorithms are called as proof of stake so we'll see that bitcoin works on proof of work ethereum works on Uh, proof of stake so we'll see the difference between them and what makes sense to if you know if you are to use one of them in your project what makes sense for you based on you know your available hardware your available uh, you know processing capacity and the specific application so we'll see the differentiation then solidity is a language that uh, is used in ethereum so we'll see an introduction to solidity contract classes functions conditionals so it won't be a very deep dive session in solidity programming because solidity programming itself is a course in itself right but we'll see the basics so uh, you pick up the basics and you've got programming background you should be able to uh, start doing programs in solidity but obviously if you don't have programming background then you know you you need to take a course specifically in solidity if you intend to write solidity code because here in this particular course we won't be able to cover that in detail right uh okay we'll see how you debug and what is the future of ethereum we'll see private blockchain versus private blockchain in ethereum how uh, private and public that uh, blockchain various blockchain setup platforms how you use ethereum to set up a private blockchain steps etc next uh, we'll see multi chain so multi chain is another in you know, a blockchain implementation so we'll see an introduction to it uh, what are the privacy information in block uh, multi chain how you mine in multi chain we'll also see the deployment of multi chain in the next uh, module so we set up a private blockchain create a blockchain i mean using multi chain uh, we'll see some commands to interact with the blockchain that you've deployed uh, and Towards the end, we'll see emerging trends. So this is more for people who are interested from business perspective, uh, where the industry is going. So I'll take you through some cases, uh, you know, implementations that the financial institutions are doing. Some of the cases from uh, trade supply uh, chain, and you know, some of um, so most common use cases uh, is in supply chain or in payments or in trade settlement, and. there are other cases in terms of ip rights right so we'll see them uh, obviously you have land registry capital market banking system use cases for government etc and on the last day we'll see uh, the innovations that are happening potential application investment trends uh, what blockchain means for the fintech and the startup landscape and what is the opinion of you know they like the central government uh, central banks of various countries regulators and politicians in terms of blockchain implementation so not everyone has the same view some countries have you know embraced blockchain with open arms some countries have gone right ahead and blocked implementation because uh, they see they think it is too private they cannot control what is happening there it could lead to money laundering it could lead to various other issues uh obviously the fear is not you know unfounded there have been instances like in the us you had silk road uh, a website which used to you know deal in all kind of illegal stuff and most of the payments were made using bitcoin so 
the governments have been trying to control it some governments have found a middle ground where you know they are not banning it thoroughly but they are asking exchanges to share enough information so they can keep a control over it so we will see all of that uh, towards the end uh, especially um, next year if you see this is the trading plan so today we'll be covering only module 1 which is introduction to blockchain it is not the full introduction uh, so we'll see in very short what a blockchain is the current issues we'll see some use cases that are already you know termed success stories and uh, in, in uh, tomorrow we'll see cryptocurrency and blockchain we'll see the blockchain versus database debate uh, next week we'll see bitcoin and bitcoin mining and how you buy and sell cryptocurrencies uh, post that we'll uh, see enhancing bitcoin ethereum we'll set up ethereum on a private blockchain then on the fourth week we'll see multi chain and deploy multi uh, chain in a private blockchain in the last week i could be emerging trends and the innovation entrepreneurship and public policy so if you see i've also written the trainer names against uh, uh, all the you know module if you notice uh, most of you know the concept related things or business related things uh, is being taken care by me uh, and most of the technical stuff where you need to set up certain uh, you know environment and work uh, towards coding is taken care by the other trainer kaka uh, so yeah that's how will be running through it. now any uh, any queries any doubts till now uh, just one thing sunil uh, when you are covering um, about its business application can you uh, also cover how it will be used in the erp can you uh, so especially you did mention that about the supply chain and finance so just yeah. so you can put some insight into that uh, because i know that couple of us are from the erp background at least four of us uh, i know that from the erp background so if you just put some emphasis around that when you are covering that okay. that will be great okay i don't have any erp specific examples today but yes mm -hmm. i'll try to find out and i'll include them uh, in the curriculum as an you know because it will okay. obviously be for design so i'll i'll try to put it okay yes uh, anyone else or we should move ahead well, one more question will we be touching on iot machine learning concepts as well no that is a separate course in itself blockchain is different from that so iot is internet of things and you know that that iot rpa machine learning etc these are you know separate not even topic they are separate subjects and courses in themselves mcal offers machine learning uh, using python so if you are interested in that you can obviously contact ashok he can help you with that so just a quick question to ashok or sridhar is it possible that um, in as part of this session we can have like half an uh, half an hour overview of like iot and machine learning so that um, this team understand um, the high level what it is about and if they interested they can join so, uh, that is the thing to give you some some handway so iot is a very vast topic we used to conduct iot training but uh, increasingly we start getting a very diverse uh, requirement so iot we are not conducting right now but uh, python machine learning we definitely conduct and if you want a half an hour session or uh, introduction to that sridhar has been the instructor as well for that training so we can cover that for iot i need to oh, check okay. because iot is very vendor specific and uh, industry specific so it is very vast uh, and uh, Uh, the overall introduction to iot without any depth will not help any cause so so machine learning we can give you the download but uh, that will be very uh, short because uh, half an hour one hour will give you only the macro things uh, sridhar can add to that you know uh, very well said ashok i think uh, to, towards the end you know when we have covered the blockchain we can have a session on uh, machine learning and uh, how machine learning is being used and uh, kind of an overview from a business angle and a very very 
minimal technical angle uh, we can give you. Uh, and, and we have our session actually starting in machine learning uh, sometime in May, I think May 19th or so. Um, right. It's a six weekend program. Yeah. So it is bigger than this. Yes. Yeah. So we, we can talk about it, you know. Uh, yeah, we can, we can, we can uh, talk about this offline. Hey, uh, okay, uh, Sunil, this is Vilay. Uh, thanks for yeah, the introduction. It, is, it looks comprehensive. Uh, one thing I wanted to quickly check is like week three, where I think we will have some uh, setups and uh, probably some technical sessions. As I heard that you talked about Solidify. Yes. So, solidity. Um, yeah, Solidity. Sorry. Yeah. So if you can, uh, I'm expecting like we will get some kind of pointers. Um, now it's difficult. I know like to get everything covered in one session. But if you, I think that is more technical session where I would be more interested to get deeper into that. So after that session, if you can provide us some resources where we can go and do something on our own, it would be really great and helpful for technical people. Yes. Sure. So uh, you know, before each session, if there's a prerequisite to have some application installed, uh, we will let you know that by email. And obviously, mm -hmm. after the session uh, offline, I can share you some links where you can you know do your own practice have okay. a look at other codes we can point you to some git repositories which you can you know sync on your machine and uh, try stuff on your own local machine so yes i'll point you to that okay sounds good thank you okay so uh, okay before we even start right now all of us are here to learn about blockchain but why should you really care i mean why why blockchain why not anything else why is it taking so much team right so i'll give you some quotes from you know, people in the industry which will set the context so this is from the ceo of ibm Gini uh and it says if you understood in 95 the opportunities and the threat that the internet would ultimately present to your company or industry uh, what could you have done differently right and if i ask this question to each one of you today you would have a lot of ideas right that is where we are with blockchain today so if if you know the challenges or the kind of problems your organization is facing today and if you know how your particular industry or company would be affected uh, by internet what would you have done you would have a lot of answers so you need to think in similar direction in terms of blockchain also it is that powerful a technology or a foundation platform that we are talking about. It will disrupt the industry. So that is why you know it is being talked about almost everywhere, and that is why people are keen on learning. Uh, no one wants to you know miss the bus. So almost every financial institution that you meet, uh, you will see they have a team you know going playing around with their own blockchain implementations. People are forming consortiums. So a lot of, you know, spending a lot of uh, work is going around in blockchain, right? Uh, the next one is from Howard Business Review. So they are saying blockchain is not just any other disruptive technology which will, you know, uh, which will attack your traditional business with a lower cost solution because that is what traditionally, you know, traditional companies or traditional technologies focus on. They, all they can do is, you know, they offer a cheaper option, but blockchain is not that. It will overtake, you know, it will, it is a foundation technology and it has a potential to create new foundations for our economic and social systems. So if you look at traditional uh, financial applications, you now some of you are from Oracle, I can give you examples in terms of your pricing and billing solutions. Uh, most, you know, Common offering is that we will lower your cost of pricing and billing engines, right? That is the primary uh, pitch that is done to banks. When, in, when we talk about blockchain, it is not just that. It is going to massively change the work, FIs work. Most of FIs incomes comes from interest, you know, interest and transactions, uh, service charges, right? But if you look at how blockchain is impacting these FIs, uh, we are talking about almost near zero charges, right? So a lot of income is going to be lost to these FIs. 
if they do not get on the blockchain bandwagon now they might lose you know a lot of their business that is why everyone is worried everyone wants to be a part of this revolution the last one is from larry summers and uh, this is important from the perspective because a lot of people think bitcoin is blockchain no bitcoin is not blockchain bitcoin uh, so normally for app you know normally for any technology the platform comes first and then there's a use case in in case of blockchain it was the other way around uh, bitcoin came into prominence okay bitcoin being a use case came first and then people realized you know bitcoin is one use case but the underlying platform that powers bitcoin is is called some real other use cases and that is when you know blockchain picked up so dear larry summers is and reasonably confident that the blockchain will change a great deal of financial practice and exchange 40 years from now blockchain and all that followed will figure more prominently in the story than bitcoin ever will right so now a lot of people know blockchain or talk about blockchain only because last year bitcoin prices you know went crazy and they crossed ten thousand dollars went up to seventeen eighteen thousand dollars that is the introduction for most people but few years on the line whether bitcoin remains or not uh, the foundational platform that blockchain is it, it will find a great deal of application in a lot of use cases in uh, in mining we'll see one of the examples uh, in healthcare and pharma and financial and money transfers lending so there are a hell lot of use cases uh, where blockchain you know will will have a great impact so this is why you know we should we really, should really care about blockchain you should at least have some working knowledge if not you know coding knowledge so from the business perspective uh, you know what you know how your company can be benefited from blockchain okay so uh, we'll we'll get into a uh, bit of history okay why why do you need uh, blockchain right so if you if, if we go you know some 100 100 or 1000 years ago okay uh, how did trade take place now suppose you know there are two people bob and alice and bob has got diamonds and alice has got rubies okay they are gem collectors they regularly meet at summits you know conferences and then you know they exchange diamonds and rubies with each other so they do negotiation and exchange gems so their choice this was the barter trade system now this worked well for them back you know then when they wanted to exchange diamonds and rubies with each other but there were a lot of problems in the barter trade right uh, would you any one of you like to take a guess of what the problems were in the barter system no one okay so the primary thing is an exchange cannot happen in one of the parties does not have you know a commodity or an item that the other party does not need right uh, there is no settled common measure of value of the items or goods of exchange right because you're trading a commodity for another commodity uh, you you can never really establish a value you know this year you've got a lot of diamonds the value of diamonds will go down next year people need a lot of diamonds but you know there's not enough mining for diamonds the prices will go up so there's no fixed value you know there was no common settled measure of uh, you've got a lot of diamonds but people don't need it it is it has no value right then there was difficulty in storing wealth so uh, if we talk about you know consumables like you know grains and veggies right these also used to be used in the barter trade but they cannot they these are perishable items so you cannot store them beyond a certain period right so there was difficulty in storing wealth or purchasing power you could not have the same purchasing power even if not utilized the items individuality of goods so say uh, you know uh, one diamond is 2 rupees right but uh, 
Alice had only one ruby and she wanted half a diamond. Now you cannot break the diamond and give it to someone, right? Like in case of money. So there was indivisibility of good or uh, trades were not as smooth. And there was no mechanism for deferred payment. So I could, I mean, in this particular case, uh, you you had to do the trade right there, right then. You could not defer the payment, right? Unless, you know, you trusted each other a lot. Uh, there was no way to defer the payment. So to, you know, over a period of time to get, get rid of these problems or overcome these uh, constraints, they realized that they needed an intermediary, right? So how do we solve this problem? We get a third party. Now it is the same trade, okay? Um, there's Bob, there's Alice, and there's a third party called Dave. Now Dave maintains a ledger, okay? And any trade that takes place between Bob and Alice has to be written on the ledger, right? So in this case, we can see uh, Alice owes five emeralds to Bob in Bob's ledger, right? In everyone's ledger, it is the same thing. Now here, Dave is a trusted party. Both Alice and Bob trust Dave. So whatever is written in Dave's ledger, they'll all agree to it, right? Uh, and this is the, so it, it's all the problem of deferred payments. Yeah, deferred payments would be made because uh, there's a trusted party who will vouch that yes, the trade took place and this is what one per, one party owes to the other, right? Sunil, what do you mean by problems in this? Sunil, yeah. what do you mean by trusted payment? Means, uh, could you show the ledger entry which they are doing for future? No, no. So, we'll, we'll get to that. This is just an example uh, okay. from the olden times, right? Uh, so when you had no physical currency, okay, uh, when you are doing barter, in barter, like we saw on the previous slide, okay, there were a lot of problems in the barter system. Okay, exchange, uh, there was no mechanism for making deferred payments, there was difficulty in storing wealth, right? So to overcome these problems, uh, you could think of these people as, you know, Someone reputed, uh, someone reputed in your village, you do a transaction in their presence, they say the transaction took place, everyone agrees, right? So it is that sort of an arrangement. Now the problem here is, although Dave can authenticate both Bob and Alice and the presence of a transaction in Dave's ledger is proof of the transaction, similarly absence of transaction in Dave's ledger means the transaction never took place, at least in his presence, right? And neither Bob or Alice can tamper with the transaction. Okay, but we are placing a lot of trust in Dave, right? Now, what happens if you know Bob say owes hundred thousand dollars to Alice? Bob says, you know, Dave, what I'll do is I'll pay you say fifty thousand dollars, and you you vouch that I you know I never took that money from Alice. It can always be possible, right? So we are placing a lot of trust in the third party. And that was a fundamental problem here, right? So obviously the system was not uh, good and it was not scalable beyond a certain point because Dave can only know Bob and Alice and you know, say maybe 20 or 30 other people who live near him. But if I had, you know, if I was sitting in uh, say New York and I wanted to do a transaction in uh, Jersey or New Jersey, uh, the, I mean, I, I would have to find someone who knew both of us in that particular area, right? But not always possible. So even this sort of trade was very limited uh, in a small geographic area, right? So there was need of a bigger third party who could be trusted, okay? And who could facilitate this trade. And this is where the financial institutions came into existence. So in, in Indian context, if you look, uh, this was normal barter transaction. This could be the Lalaji in your village, and this is where banks came into existence, right? So what banks do? Primarily, banks will accept deposits and they will lend it out to someone. Or banks will maintain a ledger, so your passbook, and the entries in the bank's books, that are the ledger, right? So in your passbook, it will always say how much money you've got in your account or how much 
money you owe to the bank right in the bank's ledger they have a daily you know continuously updating ledger in which it will always say how much is the bank's assets how much is the bank's liabilities etc for facilitating all this uh, banks earn interest and service fees right so the problems that we had the previous with the previous two versions of the trade were solved with the you know upcoming of uh, the financial institutions and they offered a way to store move and lend money if we see in the previous example uh, trade was very limited you know knowing people directly so you could not move a large sum of money or you know goods from to a different place because you had to know the person beforehand right the problem with financial institutions it is expensive there's a lot of fees so anyone i mean most of you guys who are sitting in us know what it costs to do a overseas transfer right so international remittances can be slow and they are expensive somewhere between 2 to 10% of your entire amount in some countries uh, most in the african belt sometimes you to do a 200 dollar transactions you are paying somewhere in 40 to 50 dollars in fees to the bank so that's a lot of money that banks are charging to facilitate these transactions plus still you know given all the technology given the you know kind of insane money banks have banks cannot be everywhere banks are here to make profit they will not set up branches where they you know they have not got the right customer base which will help them grow so they remain inaccessible to a large amount of population right but all this is bad but not really that bad okay which ultimately led to bitcoin coming in place so what triggered this there was uh, a big uh, yeah. before this i would like to know where is this 2 to 10% is this related to whatever money we send to india or because that is the only one time i see something is getting deducted or i need to pay extra but if i am buying something by using uh-huh. my credit card or debit card i don't pay anything extra so we uh, do 10% you don't pay anything, yeah you don't okay. pay anything extra but merchant pays on your behalf to the clearing so when you, so 2% is the generic fees that the network pays so visa or mastercard whoever whatever payment you make right the issuing bank the ordering bank and network uh, everyone has got commissions in that so any transaction that you do they will share that 2% among them right you mean to uh, say uh, you mean to say suppose in restaurant if i am paying 20 dollar out of that 20 dollar if they are putting that receipt to bank this yes. 2% will be deducted and rest of the amount they will get is that happens so if you pay 100 dollars in cash to a merchant the merchant okay. gets 100 dollar of cash entirely right but if you swipe a card at the POS terminal with the merchant when the settlement happens merchant will get only 98 right okay. so that 2 dollars is shared by the issuing bank uh, by the ordering bank and visa or mastercard or american express whoever was the network provider so who takes this assuming i have bank of america visa card so visa is yes. different entity yes. and bank of america that is a different entity so who Correct. takes this 2 percent everyone shares it so when you swipe your card it might not have been a bank of america uh, pos machine right the acquirer could have been say another bank say maybe merrill lynch or city bank okay so when you swipe it at a city bank pos okay all these three parties will share uh, that two percent among them okay okay and i mean it would it would look like a small amount but when you have uh, millions and millions of transactions going through even that two percent adds up to a lot of things and we are talking about credit cards uh, when you talk about international remittances uh, the fees is a lot lot more okay and it is slow so i want to send 100 dollars from us to india okay if you you got a priority account and if you got you know a certain threshold set that is fine otherwise it takes somewhere between 3 to 7 days uh, in certain regions it could take more because there are a lot of checks that needs to be done in terms of money laundering uh, depending upon your risk profile depending upon your the country's risk profile etc right so it is slow plus it takes a lot of money 
and it is okay. not available to everyone right so for people like us yes banks are accessible but think about immigrant workers okay who you know work for labor jobs they don't even have bank accounts right so what they'll do is they take their card uh, they they'll go to these money transfer agents they'll go to probably western union to take cash now western union would charge a lot more than a bank would do right so all these problems are there for them and this is where blockchain i uh, will see the case of one of the startups which is uh, helping in uh, you know these cases abra so we'll see that how it has eliminated the fees how it is eliminating these intermediaries and making it easy for everyone yeah i'll be happy if sometime you can explain how visa systems and other systems works because once i was going through how blockchain works or cryptocurrency works visa was mentioned in that uh-huh so some of uh, visa or mastercard that is related with this transaction uh, bitcoin or blockchain is related somewhere no it's not related it's not related it's an entirely different network i can touch okay. base upon them but uh, i mean payments itself is a huge course in itself so i can touch base very uh, you know lightly on that but that is not uh, you know part of the scores and we shouldn't be delving that because if if i start on payment that itself will be a you know two week course so i'll do a small you know, i'll i'll touch base very lightly on that probably in the next yeah time. yeah that will be great because i want to understand the problem in the current system okay so for so, example when yeah. you when you yeah when you swipe a card today okay it is not that the merchant gets paid immediately right at end of the day the merchant would be so when you swipe a card you get the at end of the day a merchant will do a you know day close on day close he'll get list of all that under thing he'll be presenting to the bank so for example this us terminal was a city bank terminal he will present it to city bank okay now you swipe your card your card was say probably from merrilink the merchant had say 500 transaction in the day okay so say 100 were from bank of america 100 were from city 100 were from say icici bank right so for his bank the you know his uh, his bank is say uh, city uh, the city poa his bank will segregate all these transactions for all the banks okay and then they will go and present it to the uh, other respective banks the respective bank will need to confirm it with visa that this transaction took place visa will confirm them once that confirmation is done uh, in the country ach this transaction will be processed it will be settled merchant ultimately gets paid somewhere two months down the line after you swipe your card right okay 60 days that is a clearing cycle for card transactions now think for small merchants Uh, his business capital is locked for two months, right? They do not have a choice. But with blockchain, you could have settled it right away. Okay. So, so right. you mean uh, this time is the limitation? There are a lot of other limitations. So we'll we'll get to that. We'll see them going forward. Okay. 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 So I was talking about the bigger problem that. Uh, led to the emergence of Bitcoin. That was the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, uh, if you guys were there in the US, you would know what it meant and how people uh, lost trust in banks, right? So it was during that time that Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, who is the, who is said to be you know uh, the founder of Bitcoin, okay, he came up with a paper on Bitcoin. coin and that led to the foundation of blockchain so there was always a need for digital currency it was always there because physical currency uh, you had you know physical coins okay in older days now they were you know it it solved the purpose uh, and the problem that barter introduced but if you had to say you know pay 100000 coins to someone in california and you are situated in maybe you know new york 
carrying 100000 coins would involve a lot of risk would involve a lot of cost itself and it would not be an easy process right so there was always a need of having digital cash right so there were always people who tried different ways to solve this problem now the problem is the way internet is designed it was never designed for digital payment right if i have to share a you know music album with you i have it i can share it with all of you at the same time right and everyone would have a copy and that doesn't mean my copy got destroyed so i've just created more copy can i do the same with money so i've got 100 dollars i send 100 dollars to all of you you all have 100 dollars and i still keep my 100 dollars original no right i mean it would lead to a lot of problem so the internet was never uh, designed for digital payments sunil so, uh, could you repeat this problem once again okay so for example you i have a mp3 song right i want to give it to you okay you ask for it i send it over whatsapp or i attach it an email and send it to you okay you have received the file now both of us have a copy of the file right yes correct yeah correct uh, does it require me to delete my copy of the file no right but in terms of money if i have to send 100 dollars that i hold currently to you okay that 100 dollars have to have to be debited or deleted from my account from my holding yes, account correct. Correct? Correct. So then, yes correct yes not designed that way right so you could not get rid of intermediary that is why you had to have banks who would do this for you right so when 100 you transfer 100 dollars to say ashok okay that 100 dollars have to be debited from your account it has to be credited to whoever you are sending it to okay and that is why you needed to intermediary bank so your bank to debit it send the confirmation to the other bank that i have debited it i will send it to you i take that guarantee you please credit the other party right yes so yes yeah now because we had intermediaries we had problem that intermediaries bring with them so fees charges and time taken by them to confirm the transaction etc right so there was always research going on to get rid of this problem right so 1983 david chom uh, wrote a paper uh, introducing the idea of digital cash so he founded a company called dg cash in 1990 and it was an electronic cash company by 98 dg cash filed for bankruptcy uh, they could not they were not able to sustain uh, the digital cash that they were producing uh, there were a lot of problems you can read about it uh, the main problem that is is called as double spending right so double spending is basically i order a transaction okay so i order a good on amazon i have got 10 dollars in my account i order a 10 dollar good on amazon before the money leaves my account before the transaction is settled i order another 10 dollar product on ebay okay so i've got the 10 dollar i've got only 10 dollar but i've ordered 20 dollars worth of product because at that point in time i was able to show both the merchants that i've got 10 dollars in my account right now when the settlement happens one of the merchants will be left unpaid because i had only 10 dollars right so that was the problem that they could not solve it is called as a double spending problem okay so post uh, dg i mean dg cash is failure uh, nick zabo was working with david chom he proposed a system called bid gold where participants solve mathematical puzzles and in reward they get bit gold currency this bit gold currency could be used for other transaction so this is what led to the foundation of bitcoin okay so after that there was another paper written by wide called b money anonymous distributed electronic cash systems all of all of these papers are freely available on google i don't recommend reading all of them uh, you should read only the last paper that was written by sarthak shri uh, it is called bitcoin appear to carry electronic cash system that should be enough to give you an idea of what 
problems existed and how they were solved by the Bitcoin blockchain. So in 2008, uh, someone by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto published a paper for a Bitcoin peer to peer electronic system. Some people suspect it was Nick Zabo himself, but the, uh, no, the blockchain ex, uh, system being an uh, anonymous system, uh, no one has really been able to find out who uh, Satoshi Nakamoto is. Some people think uh, he is in. Uh, he is a programmer in Australia. Uh, last year, there was a report from FBI saying they'll, they've been able to nail down who Satoshi is based on you know his writing style. So they ran a fuzzy algorithm on. Uh, someone is getting a call. Can you please mute it? Yeah, I just yeah, I just. Yes. Okay, so. Sorry, I forgot. Yeah, so last year FBI, uh, you know, uh, wrote a report saying they've been able to track who Satoshi Nakamoto is uh, based on his writing style. So they they did some they ran some text matching algorithm, and based on uh, some other reports written, they did not reveal the name. So based on other reports available in the public domain, they said they've been able to match the writing style and they been able to find who Satoshi is, but no one really knows who he is. Right. So in 2009, uh, Satoshi put the Genesis block on blockchain. Genesis block in any, any blockchain is the first block that they created. So the message that was on the Genesis block is uh, the Times. It was a new, it was a newspaper headline. So the Times, third Jan 2009, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. So like I said. Uh, the financial crisis of 2008 is what led people to, you know, find alternatives to bank. And it was at that same time that uh, Satoshi came up with this paper. So that is why this message. Uh, this is what the paper looks like. The PDF is freely available. You can download it. Uh, it was written in 2008 by Satoshi. Uh, this is the crux of the paper. The paper is some, I, I guess, 9 to 11 pages long. Uh, if you are interested, you can read it, or this is the crux of the paper. Now, people who are from the technical background should read it line by line. People who are not from the tech background, they should only read whatever is highlighted in blue. You would not miss any value by skipping the words written in white. Uh, they just add more technical value to it. I'll be reading it entirely, but you know, when when you receive this uh, presentation and you don't want to focus on the tech part, you understand what is written in blue and uh, it should be good to go. So what the Bitcoin paper said is, it is a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash. Uh, it would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. Now today, if you have to send money uh, even regionally, within your own country, within your own state, within your own city. If you have to send it online, you have to go through a bank. Okay, you cannot send it over Gmail. Right, so there has to be an intermediary. Okay, Bitcoin suggests peer to peer directly from one party to another without any intermediary, without any financial institution. A trusted party, third party is not required to prevent double spending. So all all, I mean, the reason we require financial institution is to prevent this double spending problem. I should not be able to spend the same money at multiple places online. Right? So that is why these banks maintain ledgers and they update uh, your balance as soon as you do a card transaction or as soon as you do an internet banking transaction. Uh, when you, that is why you require a trusted party, third party. But in Bitcoin blockchain, uh, you don't require a trusted third party and we'll see how. Uh, we propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof of work, forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof of work. So, Sunila, assuming, uh, yeah. uh, sorry for interruption. No problem. So, uh, problem clear with the older system, time consuming and 2%. So, assuming, mm -hmm. 
using this cryptocurrency if i have to send you 100 dollar how will i send and uh, will you get the 100 exactly that is the first question if yes is there any third party who is maintaining that uh, ledger type of thing? Because ledger is required anywhere. Ledger is required and, if, and blockchain, it's blockchain. The definition of blockchain is that it is a distributed ledger. So blockchain itself is a ledger. Okay, so that is okay. So and we'll show you like how, how that happens. We'll see that. Oh, we'll okay, see that. so, so just uh, I would like to understand. Yeah. If I'm sending you $100, you will get 100 somewhere ledger is maintained the person who is maintaining the ledger will need mm -hmm. some money from either you or me because on our behalf he is Correct. doing some task i agree and we'll come to all of that so okay. I, I would say hold that question for some time we'll get to all that okay okay yeah now how do we do this so they are saying the longest chain not only serves as a proof of the sequence of events witnessed but the proof that it came from the largest pool of cpu power uh, even if you ignore that i'll just read what written do so a majority of cpu power is controlled by nodes that are not cooperating to attack the network what does that mean that all of the people that are on the network okay these they are good guys we 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 believe them to be, be good guys they will not attack the network and they only work for the betterment of the network okay uh, how that matters okay why do we need good you know node from the network we'll see the importance of that so what the paper says is you have to have a lot of nodes and all of these nodes should be willing to cooperate with each other they should be willing to not attack each other okay the next point is the network itself requires minimal structure. Messages are broadcast on best effort basis. So nodes can leave and join whenever they want, okay, at their will. But whenever they join, they have to accept the longest proof of work chain as a proof of what transactions happened when they were not there, right, while they were gone. So it is not necessary that if you are on Bitcoin blockchain, you have to be online 24 by 7. You, you know, you can be gone for days, you can be gone for months, you could be gone for years, you could be joining right now. But when you join, your computer or your node will download information uh, from the network. And that information is, I mean, when you download that information, you have to believe that everyone else has done their part and you believe those transactions. Right? So that was the paper in nutshell. Mm. Now, for some of you, this may still be confusing, so I'll try simplifying it a little more, right? So what we are saying in a nutshell is, we have a peer-to-peer -peer electronic transactions and interactions without financial institutions. We will have cryptographic proof instead of central trust, so banks or the financial institutions for the central trust. Uh, we put trust in the network instead of a central institution. So while we were talking about uh, you know, banks or financial institutions, all of our trust was placed in those central in intermediaries, right? In blockchain, we do not trust the central institution, but we trust the network as a whole. So whatever the network agrees is the ultimate truth. Okay, does that make it easy? That explanation makes it easy? What the paper tried to say? Sunira, do we have some diagram? As like earlier, Bob, Alice, and Dave. Uh, we'll not today, but we'll have it one of the sessions. Uh, probably tomorrow, tomorrow or in second week's first session. Okay. So we'll, yeah, this. So this is not blockchain. This is about Bitcoin. We are just creating the foundation for that. When we come to blockchain, we'll see what a block is, what it looks like, how a block is placed. So we'll have a diagram for that. So uh, Sunila, we have covered basically problems but it still i'm not clear okay bitcoin that is going to correct double spending and uh, instant payment mm -hmm. but still i have some confusion as like uh, means how it will go as like i gave you an example i'm sending you 100 dollars mm -hmm. there will right. be two computers or one computer is giving basic that is keeping right. the ledger okay i'm mm -hmm. sending you you are sending me so mm -hmm. who is owning that computer 
earlier it was financial institution now it will be someone else so now no one is owning that computer no one is owning that computer you know, who, who is who, who is you paying have, that uh, resource yeah, costing you must use storing no i am yeah. really not very good in financial domain basically no, no, so i am not not financial domain that. not financial domain yeah okay torrent so, for download yeah i have yes. used that so who owns the files or who owns the torrent i never no one that yeah no one owns it right because everyone owns it you upload something and 100 people download it they contribute in uploading so now there are 100 people uploading then 1000 people downloaded there are 1000 people uploading okay not all of us you know upload after downloading so there are some leeches okay but there is no central party to it okay no one is responsible okay. for it but more the number of people in the network better will be the download speed better will be the resource availability so bitcoin blockchain is based on the same concept okay it is a peer to peer network there are no central intermediary so there is no one particular person who is responsible for maintaining the ledger the entire network collectively manages the uh, ledger so as soon as the transaction happens the transaction is pushed on the network okay but the transaction is not committed because it has not been validated yet right you have just initiated the transaction it will take 10 minutes and we will see why 10 minutes so it is not part of today's session okay i will be covering it tomorrow uh, in the bitcoin uh, module why it takes 10 minutes okay post that 10 minute someone who is called as a miner who has solved the problem will take your transaction and say this transaction is validated okay so everyone who is available on the network at this moment please go ahead and update your a uh, ledger that this transaction has taken place okay as soon as that transaction is broadcasted on the network everyone who receives the copy of it will update it in their ledger so that transaction has taken place now it is not the responsibility of one person anyone who is live on the network will take it and update it suppose you are not live you know you are vacationing in bahamas you came and joined the network 7 days later right so when you start your node okay it will download all the information that has been missing for these 7 days right so it will download all of that information on your node before you are able to do any mining okay so when you download that you will see all these broadcasts that have happened and have been accepted by other people that is why uh, the nodes have to agree not to you know attack each other or not to add bad transactions to the network right that is why we are removing the central intermediary and removing the trust from the third party and we are putting the trust in the network so the entire point is that we are believing in the network being good in the people on the network being good till now it has worked till in you know in the same way one of the security issues is this that we are placing a lot of trust in the network tomorrow someone you know with a large amount of processing capacity comes in uh, there's attack called civil attack okay we'll see that so for now you can think of that you know sci-fi movies where someone comes in hacks the entire us database and he's able to control everything that happens right uh, that kind of situation can happen in blockchain that is one of the security issues that can happen in blockchain because the network is held so important in blockchain does that yeah, answer got it uh, yeah definitely is great uh, explanation i am yeah. now clear at least okay so we'll we'll see yeah. all that in detail we'll see all that in detail how run that can happen <coughs> don't worry about it hey, if so, you don't right now yeah uh, sunil uh, yeah, this yeah. is when uh, i have a hypothetical okay. question and yes. uh, you can answer that later not uh, if you are covering that uh, any kind of very hypothetical and a very basic question mm uh-huh. suppose internet is not available i am into a world where suppose internet goes down for a day in the whole yeah. world yeah so and i want some urgent money blockchain will not work <laughs> okay 
Because in the bank, I can go and stand in the line and get my cash transaction done immediately. Were you here in India when demonetization happened? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you will know what you are talking about. <laughs> yeah. So okay. No problem. So, yeah. No, I got get your point, and that is a fair question. So, I mean, things like that can only happen in case of an you know apocalypse. But yes, no. I mean, you are putting everything on the network. If the network is not available, everything is gone. Okay. Okay. So I think it is same case with the bank also. If the bank network is down, you will not be able to get the money, right? Yes. Yeah. That also a good point. Yeah. So bank also rely on the network. Yeah, got it, got it. Thank you, man. Okay. So, what is so? I mean, we solve that problems, right? And what Bitcoin proposes. So that is where blockchain came from. Uh, what blockchain does basically is it lets people who have no particular confidence in each other collaborate without having to go through a central authority. so not just in case of banks okay if if i want to do a trade transaction currently okay i want to import some goods uh we do it through banks right so the banks will give you a letter of credit you present it to the merchant merchant ship to good and then the banks pay to each other uh banks you know obviously make a lot of money doing this transaction but we have to do it because we do not you know trust each other so we think it is better to have a uh, third party who will do all of this uh, you know and lessen the risk on us uh, even though if though you know they are charging some fees for it so any application where you think that a third party is required okay for maintaining trust on your behalf is a use case for blockchain so kyc right kyc or uh, when you join a new company they do background checks on you right or when you take an in- insurance they'll run your medical history they want you know all your medical records now all of this can only be done by third party right the verification can be done by third party so all of these are very good use cases for blockchain if you can get all of the data on blockchain and make sure that any new transaction that happens is recorded on the blockchain the need for third party is gone right if if you know i were to Uh, create a profile for you on the blockchain okay no matter where where you you know go for a new kyc you could just simply show you know whatever your blockchain id is and you would be very fair you don't need to uh, do it again because you've been verified once the data cannot be tampered by anyone else blockchain is designed in such a way so we'll see tomorrow uh in which cases you should be using blockchain and not relational databases one of the primary differences is blockchain is an add only operation right on the blockchain you can only add data so when you are doing transactions suppose uh, you had a balance of 100000 today you transfer 50 you know 50000 to someone else Though your new balance would say fifty thousand, there would still be a record saying you had hundred thousand at this point of time on this particular day. Okay, so that block once created is never tampered or never changed. That block will remain in existence forever. Correct. So data cannot be changed or amended. Only it can be only way to update is create a new record and make it the latest record. Right. So. basically i mean the economics says uh, blockchain is simply put it is a machine for creating trust that is the simplest explanation for blockchain that you can get uh, so i think at the start uh, when we were doing introduction someone said uh, how how do we you know identify good business use cases in our organization this is one of the most simplest explanation if you have a process where you rely on some other third party to establish trust for your process you can replace that third party using a blockchain hey yes, sunil i have one question about you know uh, discussing about uh, you know bitcoin and uh, we are forgetting that you know 
any things you know we are when we are saying a bank we are saying also like you know countries also involved in that you know what i'm trying yes. to say is you know country own the bank and yes. you know we trust on that and the way it is right now is working is certain part of the bank is also owned by the country each country and they yes. are getting benefited by that correct so how you know if we will do this type of transaction like you know cryptocurrency and all so how that you know that uh, the benefit you know the country is getting lost by that how the country will control that and yeah, if you see that, every country want to control the money so that is a specific reason why you would see there have been a lot of uh, regulations in stopping cryptocurrency transactions in the past year A lot of countries have gone ahead and banned it right away. Yes. Right. So yes. fair point, but yes, government wants to control. They want to. They don't want to lose uh, their share, so they will not let things happen. Yes, and that may so, cause a lot of problem. Like you know, if uh, you know, uh, we are not involving country also. Like it, it may uh, money laundering and many things can be uh, go. You know. Correct. Correct, and that I mean, it is not that it has not happened. Yes, a lot of money laundering has happened. So countries that are specifically put on the sanction list by the US, if you see when uh, Bitcoin picked up initially when it went to seven thousand levels, a lot of transactions were from Iran. So people were putting money in it. Yes, money laundering did happen, but you know we can't you can't do anything about it. Similar so, related to this, uh, sorry, please wait. Yeah. So related to this, I have one question. Uh, assuming I am sending you hundred dollar, I am going yeah. to Bank of America. Bank of America is sending to you. But mm-hmm. if you choose the blockchain, if I am sending and you can't get, mm-hmm. so to whom will I blame at that time? See, okay, good question. Thing is. So, I mean, what whatever bank you spoke about, I forgot the name. So, for example, City Bank. City Bank will not send money on the Bitcoin network. Okay. On the Bitcoin network, it is only Bitcoins that are traded or transferred. Right. So you will have to go to an exchange, pay them hundred dollars. Exchanges which sell Bitcoins, right? Pay them hundred dollars. They will give you hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. They will be in your digital wallet. From that digital wallet, you can get the other party's uh, blockchain address and send the Bitcoin to them. Okay, so they will release, it, they will get it in real time. Okay, there would be a certain transaction fee to it. Okay, but it is much less than what banks will charge you. We'll see what the fees are, you know, like uh, in the current networks. Uh, so the transaction happens real time. Okay, the other party who receives the block, uh, the Bitcoin. Okay, if he wants to cash out, he can sell it in one of the exchanges in his country. Okay, so he gets cash in his country, in his particular currency. Now, the same transaction in using banks would have been possible if yeah. it were an international transfer. It would have taken you two to three days, in excess of three days, to have sent it via the Swift network. Yeah, so my question is: Correct. In case of bank, uh, if you are not getting money, I can go and ask bank why you have not got my money, and bank is responsible for that. Give me answer. What about this uh, Bitcoin or blockchain? To whom will I ask uh, so, you why my coins are not reached to uh, you? So, so it is transparent, right? You don't have to ask anyone. Uh, you can and you can you know just open the website uh, for tracking it. You know, or whatever coin you use, and it would show you. I mean, it like in case of banks, okay, the money is debited from your account. It is not credited to the other party for three days, so you are in luck where the money is. In case of Bitcoin or any other coin, okay, it is not that way. Once your transaction is executed, the money will reflect in the other party's account immediately, okay. It is not going through a series of banks and then ultimately getting deposited there. So either it is in your account or it is in the other party's account. If you put the right address, there is no 
way that money is lost in between unless okay. you know you entered a wrong party's address in which case the money will go to the wrong party you cannot do anything about it okay we will still be able to see that the money left your account it reached the other party's account it was a wrong account okay so so in fact what you said is one of the problems that banks or financial institutions currently have okay you they debit your account and for days that money is not available anywhere right but in case of blockchain that does not happen yeah correct yeah basically i was going to it is based on the hash and it can't be hacked but recently someone told me that in india or some other place it was hacked so not only in india not only in okay. india it was uh, one of the major exchanges in us i forgot the name okay. so the network is never hacked right each user okay. has his own account okay now if your okay. account is hacked if someone knows your secret if someone knows your passwords uh, either you know they they did a phishing scam or somehow they got the your information right once they have your passwords and account details it is as good as you doing the transaction or them doing the transaction right so the network is never hacked what is hacked is individual users it could be because of bad password policies it could be because they wrote the password down somewhere okay it could be that they okay. stored their passwords or exchanges did not have enough security but the network itself has never been hacked till now okay so it means so uh, we are we are it, taking lot sorry. of risk okay sorry it mean we are taking lot of risk here how i mean why do you say we are taking a lot of risk uh, like you know so if something goes wrong you know mm-hmm. entirely things can be wrong right the intention of everything can be wrong but like in the current banking system uh, we have lots of control we can block them at a lot of places even though it is hacked or something wrong went wrong in fact it's the other way around the current system is more vulnerable if you if you read financial news every year a lot of banks a lot of customers are hacked uh, with blockchain security is a lot more uh, compared to the existing security that we have so the chances of getting hacked on blockchain or the network getting hacked is almost negligible compared to existing banking hello yeah as pervez i think so you are getting the answer okay so one uh, thing more basically as i have sent 100 dollar to you who hmm. will give me cryptocurrency over some site i have to go and i have to purchase that cryptocurrency yes yes so there are exchanges which trade these currencies like you've got stock exchanges you've got exchanges for these coins also uh, okay in india there's a famous exchange binance there are a lot of exchanges in india you have coins yeah, i think uh, yeah you are going to cover all of these things right in subsequent course yes, right? yeah 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 sunil so, um Yeah. I think, okay. Uh, yeah. Let's move on. Mm. Okay. So basically, what is what powers blockchain, right? So these are the three things. Uh, one is peer-to-peer communication. The other is cryptographic encryption, and third is distributed network with a shared ledger. Now, if you see, none of them are unique or something you know that was invented or innovation. All of these have existed for ages. The only Thing, you know that Bitcoin or blockchain got us put this in a way that it was unhackable. Uh, it provided all the benefits that we spoke about, right? So peer-to-peer communication, like I said, torrent we've been using for ages. Cryptography we all know has existed for long, long time. Distributed networks we all know, right? But putting all these three together in a way that we could share information without the need of a central intermediary. is what uh, the you know is what satoshi did in his bitcoin paper okay so when you see this these are the four building blocks of blockchain you have a shared ledger you have 
cryptography you have a shared contract and you have something called as consensus which we will see soon consensus is basically the protocol through which everyone on the network agrees that a transaction has taken place right so there are certain algorithms to it uh, depending on the type of blockchain you are using right uh, the algorithm would be different and the consensus mechanism would be different so in shared ledger uh, shared ledger will have history of all the transactions like i said some time back it is an append only immutable with immutable path so once a transaction is written okay it cannot be edited it, even if it is an erroneous transaction that has taken place okay if it is wrong data even if it is wrong data once it is there on the ledger it is there on the ledger you cannot change that copy all you can do is create a new copy okay with the updated data okay so that is why there will always be a huge audit trail of all the changes all the transactions that have taken place on the ledger okay and that is one Sunil, of our just, just quick question you mentioned about this consensus and there are algorithm around that so will you be covering hmm. the different algorithm and in which situation which algorithm will be applying uh we don't As part of your course i will tell you the algorithms we don't really apply algorithms or we not supposed to apply algorithms when you choose a particular blockchain implementation right for example if you choose a bitcoin blockchain or if you choose a ethereum blockchain or if you use a multi chain blockchain these platforms themselves have chosen those algorithms right oh, okay you okay. automatically get it now based on the type of transaction or the type of usage okay you will choose these particular one and the algorithm automatically comes with it so you yeah that's what the uh, build or choose it. yeah yeah so that's what i want to understand like there are four five algorithms so there are specific right. purpose why this algorithm is used what this algorithm is yes. used so kind of yes. thing you will be covering uh, as part yes. of this course right yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. so cryptography uh, cryptography ensures the integrity of the ledger authenticity of the transactions privacy of the transactions and it ensures privacy of identity of participants so on on blockchain no one knows who you are right you are assigned an address like everyone else you do transactions using that address no one no one would be able to find who is behind that address right so it ensures complete anonymity uh shared contracts so contracts are basically logic embedded in the ledger executed together with transactions there could be self and person smart contracts we'll see what smart contracts are for now you could you know i'll i'll give you a very simple explanation so these are self executable code that are placed along with your transactions on the blockchain as soon as that condition takes place okay it could be a time based con condition it could be a event based condition as soon as that condition takes place and that event is verified to have taken place the contract automatically executes itself so for example i wanted you know i want to pay my rent on 30th of every month as soon as that you know event get fulfilled uh, the rent is automatically debited now this was a very simple example but think in case of trade life cycle right for trade fulfillment currently there is a lot of paperwork that happens okay the goods are received on the shore someone inspects it they sign it put a stamp it will go to the bank the bank will verify it the bank will say okay good to go it will come to the paying bank the paying bank will verify everything and then the payment happens if you had a smart contract as soon as the goods you know were offloaded scanned at the barcode the barcode why iot sends a signal to the bank that you know we have received it and we are good to make the transfer the transfer happens so it has simplified the process a lot so you could have self executing contract consensus like i said there are a lot of protocols uh, based on the type of um, blockchain platform that you use that you are going to use and you use one of the consensus algorithm to arrive uh, on the consensus that the transaction has taken place hey sunil uh, yeah sunil i have one quick question on the identity of participants yeah. so how do we make sure that good money is flowing into the network currently you can't okay you can't 
So the only way you can do that is uh, these exchanges from where you buy, uh, they will do a KYC of you. Okay. Okay. And you are adding money from banks currently, so they will identify. I mean that part is still there. But once you are into the blockchain, no one can identify who you are and what you are. That is why I mean a lot of governments have put restrictions around what can happen. Currently in India, I think almost all of the exchanges have stopped allowing adding any new more money. Uh, using your debit card for internet banking for purchasing coins. Okay. 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 And uh, I mean, when we go further, you'll obviously realize money, you know, transferring money from one point to another is obviously a big use case, but still a very, very small and limited use case of blockchain. Blockchain can be used for a lot many applications, and we'll see how. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll quickly Thank move you. to yeah. I'll quickly move to the challenges that we have currently. Uh, first thing is limited scalability. Okay. Now, because it requires that the transactions be broadcasted to everyone on the network. Okay. We we expect each node in the network to process every transaction that has taken place. Okay. So you can see that is placing a lot of stress on the network. Okay, that is why currently there is limited scalability. Now, there, in the past year or so, there has been a lot of research around this. Uh, one group from Australia has claimed to, you know, have uh, solved the scalability problem, and they say they they can scale as much as Visa and Mastercard, but there is no real. Uh, implementation of them yet okay so the problem still stands unless someone is able to crack it uh, core benefit of decentralization consensus based blockchain is security neutrality and censorship resistance now censorship is a lot of governments place a lot of censorship on what you can buy what you can do with you know your money okay uh, there's no neutrality okay and even in terms of security so blockchain promise to solve all this but to solve all this uh, we went decentralized correct now it requires a lot of processing power and electricity to uh, do all this because you've got a lot of nodes you, you require a lot of processing power to uh, mine these transactions we'll see what mining is right so for now you can understand there is some complex process a uh, complex problem that the computers are trying to solve. To solve that problem, they require a lot of computing. They make a lot of guesses. Okay, so that requires a lot of processing power. Okay, that is why it is not that scalable. Now, if it is not that scalable, it will not remain viable for smaller players to be part of that. Okay, which would mean the smaller players exit the network. When the smaller players exit the network, what will happen is only the large players will a lot of processing power will remain in the network. So what did we aim when we started with blockchain? We aim decentralization. But the problems around scalability is again leading it to be centralized. Good that? Hello? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, OK. So this scalability leads to two major problems. One is low throughput. Okay, so blockchains can only process a limited number of transactions. Currently, the Bitcoin blockchain uh, processes about one transaction per second, and the technical limitation is seven transactions per second. So you cannot on a, on the Bitcoin blockchain you cannot do more than seven transactions per second. If you think about the current banking systems or the current you know credit cards, debit cards, that is way less than what the current you know network offers that is why we cannot mainstream bitcoin payments for now right now even technically if you can make some changes to the current bitcoin network uh, where you increase the block size currently the block size is just 60 byte you can increase it to 1 mb okay it would still only be able to uh, you know
Yeah. So uh, Visa typically processes 2,000 transactions per second. Okay. Twitter, you've got 5,000 tweets per second. At peak times, it is 15,000 you know, tweets. Similarly, for Visa, it is 20,000 transactions per second. Uh, compare this with seven transactions that can be done on blockchain. We know it is not it is not that you know we would like on our banking systems. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, there are other coins that have solved this problem, but they have relaxed the uh, algorithms, right? So you have to trade off between the level of security or the number of transactions that you can do. Correct. So that is one limitation. The other is uh, slow transaction times. So like I said some time ago, on the Bitcoin blockchain, you have to wait at least 10 minutes for the transactions to have confirmed. Now imagine you are said, you know, you are in a supermarket to swipe your Bitcoin credit card, and the merchant, you know, tells you that sir, we've swiped your card. Please wait for 10 minutes and come back again, so I can confirm your payment has taken place, and only then you can go out of the supermarket. Would you use that? You would never, right? So transaction times uh, is a major bottleneck currently in blockchain networks. Uh, there's some background noise. Can other people go on mute, please? We cannot speak. Uh, Sunil, I guess it is from your machine. Uh, can you please go on mute? Yeah. Uh, the next is cartel formation. So this is a quote from Bill, uh, Vlad Zamfir. Uh, he's a renowned Ethereum researcher. He says cryptocurrency is incredibly concentrated. Right. So, and the same is about mining power. So a lot of, I mean, groups who have a lot of mining power, they control uh, the cryptocurrency. So even in current markets, in the current world, we know that you know people will always form groups will form cartels and try to control things not just you know uh, money in any industry you take examples of pharma you take examples of it anywhere right people will always try to form cartels and control and manipulate the group uh, the same problem exists in blockchains also so a person who's got a lot of money can purchase a lot of computing power and he can control the network right so cartel formation is completely expected in our context and we should be uh, aware about it. We should be constantly looking for ways to avoid from, you know, uh, cartel formation happening. Uh, two slides down the line, we'll see something called a civil attack. So we saw that for a transaction to take place, everyone on the network has to agree that the transaction has taken place, right? So the proof is that a majority of people on the node are agreeing. Now, if majority of the people on the node uh, are my own people, right? I can get them to agree to anything, right? Because those are my people. So if I control more than 51% of the network, I can push fake transactions on the network they will be validated and because more than half people, half of the people agree that the transaction has taken place, the transaction will be thought to have actually taken place on the network. So that is the civil attack, uh, which blockchain implementations are, you know, it is a major uh, issue with blockchain implementations. Uh, the next is network size. So blockchains like I said, we expect people to be good on the network, okay? But that doesn't mean bad, bad actors or bad people will not come in the network. When that happens, uh, you respond to it and you grow strong, stronger, right? So someone does, does something wrong, you identify him, that person is kicked out of the network. But you cannot do it preemptively because we are offering anonymity, so we don't know who it was until He's done something malicious, right? So we can only learn and then respond to the attack and then grow stronger. This will require a large network of users, 
it and a blockchain is not a robust network with widely distributed grid of nodes you will not be able to realize full benefits of the network so with a small network it makes no sense to have a blockchain you you might as well you know stay on the relational database you have to have a large uh, network of users to realize the full potential of blockchain at the same time if the network i mean if the network becomes too huge you will have people who will have ill intent and they'll try to cause some harm to the network the next one is human error so in a database if there's a human error you can always go ahead and update the data right a simple update command and you are sorted but on blockchain if something is committed once it is committed for always right you can always add a new transaction uh, but whatever was written once cannot be updated or deleted so the data that goes into blockchain needs to be of high quality because this data right from the genesis block to till date information is always there on the network right so there is a storage cost associated with the network if you are putting junk data on network you will be paying huge cost in terms of storage so you need to be very careful of what you are putting on the blockchain so the phrase garbage in garbage out holds true specifically in blockchain that is why uh, you need to cleanse your data and make sure that only you know the perfect correct right data is being written on the blockchain uh, blockchain database uh, the next one is size and bandwidth so this data is from last year uh, it would have changed a lot by now but even if you look at the data bitcoin blockchain last year Uh, was about 25 GB, okay, and last year it added about 14 GB of transactions uh, in one year, right? So if you were to join the network, say last year, you would have to download about 25 GB of data before you could able to, you know, put any transactions or start mining. If we were thinking of Bitcoin blockchain to grow to the levels of Visa, where it has to process 2,000 transactions per second. we would be adding 1.42 petabytes per day or 3.9 gb data to the blockchain every day right that is unsustainable for a new you know miner or a new node to join because before they can start anything they'll have to download that amount of data right at this rate it becomes unmanageable for nodes with smaller power uh, processing power and bandwidth so again the same problem because the smaller nodes can no longer participate a handful of nodes with large processing power and storage power will control the network so that is one challenge that is another challenge basically security so we already spoke about the civil attack uh, that is from security perspective usability so currently uh, whatever technologies we use there is a lot of uh, ready apis available there is a lot of documentation available Uh, they are user friendly but in terms of blockchain apis uh, they are not very user friendly when compared to the current standard of easy to use modern day apis like restful apis then there is versioning hard fork and multiple chains and these issues you know currently because the technology is new they will require a lot of thought to be put before they can be mainstream any questions on this hello there's one last more question okay when i yeah at least say yes or no because otherwise i think everyone will drop <laughs> no i know so what is a cyber attack that you have mentioned there uh, cyber attack is basically the same thing where you have more than 51% of the node agreeing with you right so for example if there were 100 computers on the node okay for a transaction to be accepted at least half of them have to agree now if of those 100 i own the 51 right even if if it were a genuine transaction i would say no the transaction never took place or i would include a fake transaction and get all the 51 to agree that this transaction has taken place because i control the network i would be able to manipulate the truth right so that is called as a civil attack oh okay not it 
Hi Sunil, uh, this is Pankaj. I'm sorry. Uh, I was just trying yeah, to uh, phrase the question. Uh, actually, you mentioned a couple of you used a couple of terminologies. Just wanted to make sure those are same. So you said said nodes in the network, and you also mentioned the miners. Are they both same? Uh, nodes and miners are the same. Uh, different terminologies. So miners, so miners, miners are basically you know they are referred as people. You know they are basically people who mine. And nodes are, yeah, you can you can interchangeably use them, not a problem. Okay, so uh, in very your basic fundamental of uh, those uh, this transaction through blockchains. So all the nodes, for example, even if I want to participate, my smartphone can be a node in the network. Yes, yes. So if you can have the mining uh, mining uh, software on your phone, I think Samsung S7 can be used. Of course, not all of the you know smartphones can be used because even basic PCs cannot be used. You'll not be able to uh, have that kind of computing power. But yes, modern some of the modern this phones yes, they can be used for mining. Okay, so the thing is, in to order to have this uh, uh, in the join the network, or you wanted to in order to use move from the centralized system or banking system to the uh, this blockchain based transaction. Uh, so any in any device any uh, any node has to be have that compute power it's like correct. It's correct. So, yes yes so you can you can go to the website of these uh, you know like for bitcoin you can go to bitcoin.org or for ethereum you can go to ethereum site you can down, download the mining software on your machine okay and you can start mining thing is you know in maybe in 2009 2010 Your normal PCs could be used to mine because there are not a lot of miners on the network, right? Because everyone wants to mine because there are rewards for mining, right? People have created specialized hardwares, right, which mines much faster than your normal PC. So you would spend entire days, weeks, months, but you'll not be able to mine anything. But you're still paying electricity. You're still paying Uh, for your network, right? You're still paying for your bandwidth, uh, internet costs, but you'll not be able to mine anything unless you've got specialized hardware that is able to solve the problem that is put by the mining algorithm in real time. So when you say mining, that means it is the the updating the the ledgers, the shared ledger, the copy of my ledger, which is with me. Not is that... no, not not just updating, right? So uh, we'll see what mining is, but. Okay. Uh, simplest explanation is when a transaction is put out, someone runs a verification on the transaction, so they will do certain computation that the transaction really took place. Right, so those people are called as miners. We'll see what mining is, so don't worry about it for now. It is simply verification of whether the transaction happened successfully or not. Okay. Okay. Uh, next is environmental challenges. So blockchain relies on encryption uh, to provide its security, as well as establish consensus over the distributed network. This means that in order to prove that a user has permission to write to the chain, complex algorithms must be run, uh, which in turn will require large amount of computing power. Right? We spoke about this. Now all of this comes at a cost, right? So Bitcoin is the most widely used network. The last years, energy consumption for the, running the Bitcoin network was equal to the electricity used by 159 countries. So you can imagine how much power was, you know, utilized or wasted in keeping the Bitcoin uh, network running. And this, this, when you know, if you know 10 people, probably one or Two of them might be knowing about Bitcoin, not even using it on a day-to-day -day basis. So imagine when this goes mainstream, the kind of uh, network and kind of power usage that you will have. Right? It is unsustainable, and that is why people are moving to other uh, algorithms or other blockchain implementations. Uh, the last point is lack of governance standards. So, like I like uh, we've seen, 
it is a decentralized uh, network there is no central authority which means no one is able to you know enforce any standards uh, it is completely open it is trustless and there's no i mean there's no permission based system so everyone is expected to safeguard uh, the network uh, but no one is responsible for setting and maintaining if anything goes wrong right so if you take example of ethereum uh, if a bug is found or if something is to be changed there are a couple of developers who leave it you know on this case basis but if they are not available they are not available nothing can be done because there is no central uh, you know control on it uh, if it were oracle and you were implementing something for the city bank something goes wrong you will be pulled you know in the middle of night to fix it but uh, because these are you know open systems trustless uh, no one is responsible for anything and everyone is responsible for everything so that is that is one you know point that works that i mean that works in negative for blockchains for public blockchains private blockchains obviously you can have control over them so guys what is the time i think uh, we'll just cover this slide and we'll cover the stories tomorrow because i think we are overrunning uh, with the time so in terms of technical challenges uh, we have inadequate tooling currently we don't have an id like we have for modern day technologies right so the current ids that they, um, that are there they're not really that good you don't have uh, you know industry acceptable build and compiler tool it is not very well documented and not easy to use uh you don't have a good deployment tool technical documentation is patchy uh, not very easy uh testing frameworks because we are i mean this we are talking about uh, a lot about finances okay we are dealing about sensitive data all of that we require a lot of security but there are no testing frameworks that support it you know exhaustively so there are some testing tools available but the kind of exhaustive testing that you have in uh, your current organizations or your current projects that are not yet available in blockchain uh, debugging is a pain uh, in the current uh, blockchain implementations uh you don't have logging tools you don't have security auditing so when i talk about logging yes you do have audit trail of all the transactions but it is not like a modern day you know tool where you would be able to query anything you here you will have to traverse the entire tree backward uh, if you were to find the source of a transaction uh, block explorer analytics you have block explorers for bitcoin and for ethereum but you don't i mean that again is not very uh, you know user friendly in terms of analytics also there is not much available right now so these are technical challenges obviously they'll be resolved you know probably this year or in the years to come uh, but if you are thinking of an implementation for your organization right there you have to keep this in mind that these are the challenges from the technical front also that you will face if you are going for implementation right now uh, i've got four slide probably we can see it and finish it so tomorrow we start with a new topic is it okay to stay right yeah yeah we are fine okay i'm i'm, so the, I'm fine yeah so the next one is abra uh, we spoke about abra some time ago so we all know uh, a lot of people migrate from their country especially from developing economies to the western world uh, to you know earn money and support their families right so in a ted talk in 2004 dilip ratha who is a renowned you know person who speaks on these topics uh speaking about immigrants they said they risk their lives to realize a dream and that dream is as simple as having a decent job somewhere so they can send money home and help the family which has with them before right. uh, true we all know i mean we all know at least few people who you know who who 
held to jobs in foreign countries and they've been trying only earning money and sending it here right uh, but we know that it is very expensive to send money overseas and especially uh, damaging for immigrants who earn small money right so uh, for people you know from from the african belt or people even from the asian countries uh, it, it may not seem a lot for the people in the us that you know you are getting charged 20 dollars on a transaction for say 2000 dollars but 20 dollars in these countries would be like a week's meal right so it is a lot of money for them uh, if you see one of the examples that i've listed uh, sending money from africa to africa from the us or europe sometimes costs up to 15 percent and within africa the fees can be stupendous to transfer 33,000 angola kwanza which is about 200 dollars from Rwanda to Nam Namibia costs about $50. So that's that's huge, right? To transfer $50, uh, the banks are charging you $50 in fees. And this is according to the World Bank price database. So that is crazy fees that the banks are charging. And because you have to, I mean, because these guys have no other option, uh, they are paying these fees. Abra is an app uh, that allows you to send money from you know, countries that they're operating to uh, these countries. So how they work is you, you purchase coins for Abra, okay? And you send it to your home country. In your home country, like you've got an app for Uber or Ola, uh, you have similar app for Abra, right? So once your family receives the money, okay? They can simply see if, if there's a person available in the vicinity who would trade the abra coins for real money right so like on like you can see the uber drivers you can see abra tellers right so you can chat with one of the tellers tell them that you've got you know these many coins and you would like to trade it at this particular rate uh, if it if you agree uh, the teller will come at your home pay you in cash now this is particularly important for such guys because if you've got family you've got uh, senior age people at your home you know they're getting money at the convenience of their home compare it with uh, western union bank where you transfer money today you tell it your you know to your folks back in your country that i've transferred the money you should be able to receive it in three to five days they walk into western union western union tells them you know the money has not arrived yet you need to check it uh, they come back home, call you, you go to Western Union, you again check with them, they tell you the payment is stuck for X, Y, Z reasons. Please check after three days. After three days, again, someone has to go to Western Union. So all of that problem is gone with Abra, right? And this is, I mean, just one application. There are a lot, many other applications which do, but Abra really picked up good, uh, specifically in Canada, uh, US and Philippines. Uh, basically, people remitting money from there to the APEC region. So it is it has been a huge success story uh, for these countries. Next is uh, you know the Dubai government is uh, planning to put all of their uh, paperwork onto the blockchain by 2020. So they have a project called uh, Smart City Dubai, and it is envisioned by the government there so the current crown prince he wants all of their uh, you know like uh, the traffic department and the local authorities the uh, you know municipal corporation all of the records to be put on the blockchain so it is transparent uh, to the citizens plus they expect a uh, saving of 25.1 million man hours per year right Right, just by putting these things on the blockchain, or in terms of dollars, they are expecting a saving of 1.5 billion per year for the Emirates, right? And much of this enhanced productivity is still just from moving to paperless government, right? So, if if a small emirate or a small you know state like Dubai can save so much in expenses by moving to blockchain, imagine it for you know larger countries. Uh, next is IBM Diamond Tracking. So most of these 
anyone remembers die another day bond guys anyone okay so the movie was about blood diamonds right uh, trafficking of diamonds it really does happen uh, from these african countries where these diamonds are mined the diamonds were smuggled uh, illegally traded so there's a lot of corruption and there's a lot of money laundering that happens because of this because the government are not able to control uh, this illegal trading right so ibm uh, developed a diamond tracking on hyperledger that is ibm's blockchain platform uh they tied up with uh, asahi refining uh, which is one of the precious metals to find up there is book diamonds us jewelry retailer and lich garner precious metals supplier and the rich line group and few other you know uh, company together they formed something called as the trust chain initiative right so now on trust chain right from the time the diamond is mined okay it is assigned an id and stored on the blockchain each time a transaction has to happen on that diamond uh, the transaction is put on the blockchain so right from the time the diamond is mined from the mines to the time a uh, ring is made you know a diamond ring is made of that diamond uh, the end consumer is always sure of the source of the diamond right so purity is one thing the other thing is you can always be sure that you're not buying illegal or smuggled diamonds you're buying the right Thing. So trust chain is what one such example in the supply chain uh, where IBM is doing it uh, for these countries. And the last one is this. I'll play a video. Let me know if you are able to hear it. No, we can't hear it. Okay, you can still uh, read the subtitles. So this is basically the World Bank food program wherein. uh they have these syrian refugees okay so what world bank does is world bank provides monetary aid to these refugees right now earlier uh, the local government would be corrupt and even after receiving the aid from uh, world bank they could you know use up the money what world bank has done is set up a blockchain got all these people verified the refugees and put them on the blockchain their retina is their password right so they could walk in to uh, they don't need basically cash or bank account they can walk into these refugee camps get their retina scanned and their daily food or you know whatever aid they have received they directly receive it so there's no other chance of you know someone some middleman taking you know uh, their money now that is i mean i i think it is a great initiative and a great implementation of the technology right uh, earlier no matter how honest a government you had someone some middleman i mean because there were a lot of middlemen involved and you trusted them to be uh, handling it there was always a chance of corruption but having put it on the blockchain there's no trusted intermediary that you require right so when we started this session i said one of the prime parameters is realizing whether in your organization's process or in your project there is a central intermediary there is a trusted intermediary and if you want to remove him okay or remove them okay a uh, blockchain makes a good case for you so with this example i think you would agree to it that there was a intermediary there was no need of that intermediary but because you had to establish trust that intermediary was there with blockchain you don't need them So any questions? Uh, that's it for the day. Hey Sunila, that's a great session today. So I have one question. We understand everything from the currency perspective. Other than two examples, one was related to diamonds, and uh, one uh -huh. more this one. So my question right. is that uh, other than the currency, where can we use uh, this uh, currency, blockchain, currency and how it works? Just, yeah, currency is just one. aspect of it there are a lot of other use cases uh, i spoke about kyc right so you have a aadhar card yes 
Aadhaar card is temperable. At least if someone has access to the database, right? They can tamper okay. with your data. Or if someone has your Aadhaar number, uh, there was a huge cry about it last year, right? If, uh, if they had your Aadhaar number, they could go, they could get your other details, right? If the Aadhaar network were built on blockchain, no one else apart from you would be able to see your data. So it is completely private, completely secure. It is anonymous. So just by having your Aadhaar number, no one else can get your details. Uh, we saw the Syrian refugee thing, right? So the Indian government also provides a lot of subsidies. All of these subsidies could be directly passed to the people uh, once they prove their, you know, uh, authenticity without having to rely on the middlemen for passing this subsidy to them. So that is another use case. Uh, interesting use case, I'll tell you. So I, we spoke about torrents, right? We all know torrents are illegal, right? But uh, these organizations, I mean, specifically the music industry and the film industry, are facing a lot of loss due to people doing piracy. Right? There have been certain, you know, uh, artists who tied up with a blockchain company and agreed that they'll release their albums only on blockchain from now. Right? Now, what happens there is. Whenever you stream their song, a embedded contract is written in the song itself. So each time you stream, you are paying for the service. A part of it automatically gets transferred to the artist's account. So he doesn't have to worry about his payment. He doesn't have to really, uh, you know, rely on the company who released his album to pay for him. Okay. So that is another interesting use case. Storing sensitive yeah. files. Right, so uh, you want to store documents, etc. You can store documents on the blockchain. No one else can view it. It is available everywhere. There are a lot of use cases, and we'll see uh, on the last day of this session. Yeah, that's great. And I think, I think Sunil, one more use case would be that if we would have a blockchain, this this Nirav Modi thing would not have never happened, right? Yes, that would not have happened in the current banking system itself, also. Uh, because because PNB wanted to save some costs on uh, not complying and not connecting their payment system uh, with the core bank. So that was just bad on their part. So, uh, Sunil, one more question. Uh, as part of this uh, session, will you be giving some assignments also, uh, which we need to, or it will be just, uh, it'll be just there covering? Will be certain, you think? There will be certain, yeah, there will be certain quizzes and some small assignments as well. Uh, nothing okay. for today because this was the first session. Uh, okay. After tomorrow's session, probably on Monday or Tuesday, I'll hand out a small quiz sort of thing on email to you. Mm -hmm. So okay. that you know you can revise whatever content we did. You can do some reading. So I will also pass some links here. You can do some additional reading, and you can complete the assignment before the next week when we start. Oh, okay, okay, fine. Okay, so in, if there are no further questions, we can close the call, and we can meet tomorrow. Uh, I mean, I'll confirm with Ashok whether you want to meet early tomorrow or meet the same time and from next week. We meet at the revised times. So, All right. right. Uh, Sunil, so I think yeah. Yes. Sunil, uh, one feedback basically. So could we put some more diagram because which content I can't read when I'm listening to you. So both Sorry. time I can't do this. Uh, could you put some more diagrams? Uh, which content I can't yes. read content whenever I'm listening to you. Yeah, that is fine. That is fine. And you will have diagrams when it is necessary. Today's was a more of an introduction and uh, theoretical session. There are really no diagrams that I can. You know, oh, okay, up. that's a great. And yeah, a little but, bit slow, with, uh, it seems some fast for me uh, because there are new terms, many new terms uh, which I need to okay. understand. Okay, so you can stop me right there when you you know feel. Uh, we okay. can you uh, can take the pace slow. So just I mean. That is why we need feedback from you. You cannot 
uh, able to get something just you know pause the right there and tell me to go through because unless i hear from you i think everything is good okay so yeah. before and, uh, we disconnect uh, this is shridhar uh, i wanted to you know quickly touch base i was out i i came back uh, uh, so uh, how was today's session uh, sharad and uh, uh, sunil and uh, is there anything that, uh, mm-hmm. sridhar from my side which i have got uh, more than my expectation so i am really very happy with this session and hope so future will be the same absolutely absolutely that's very uh, nice to hear um what we will do is i think uh, ashok and me we were talking offline um, i think ashok will get in touch with sunil uh, pande our instructor and he's going to work on the you know audio uh, you know, few things we had early on in the call so we're going to fix that so we're going to do a test i think we, we probably need to get new hardware or whatever so we, we're going to take care of that and we're going to fix it if if there was any inconvenience today we're going to eliminate it okay, yeah let me because i just wanted to talk to talk about that because i don't know whether it was me but uh, the the sound was like coming but it was you know sometimes good sometimes <clears throat> intermittent like there was some uh, this thing uh probably i don't know what what was the i was able to understand but i have to put a lot of attention to that it was not coming out very clearly but sometimes it was coming surprising i don't know yes yeah, you, you're right yeah so okay yeah. Oh. Yeah, your mic yeah yeah so we we will uh, test with another mic again and uh, okay. after testing we will uh, use that itself so because okay. it was in it was in packets today sometime it is all right sometime it was some static noise so we will fix it yeah. uh, to tomorrow onwards okay sridhar uh, uh, hey sridhar uh, one more request uh, as you are going to upload this uh, video or send video, videos to us could you do noise resolution first and send us is it for seven so we do have a video editing software and i'll try to uh, do my best in this oh, okay and uh, uh, remove those uh, Uh, i'm not a very good digital uh, person but I, i'll try my best there are some options there that allows us to you know, tone it a little bit I, i'll try my best uh, okay thanks a lot today awesome awesome okay. so good so yeah, sridhar I, one more thing mm-hmm. as we discussed i think uh, if we uh, like uh, who are is planning to continue this so can we start tomorrow at 6:30 am uh, pacific so am to 9 so sunil is right here so let's let's have a discussion with ashok and sunil so the folks here they want to start 6:30 what would be that india time sharan we 7 pm yeah. 7 7 pm your time uh, would that be um, uh, manageable uh, 7 pm india time india time sunil are it's you it's okay for me i am i am yeah. fine with that okay then then it's great done so tomorrow's session will be at 7 then uh, india time and your 6:30 okay perfect perfect so, so hope those are not speaking they are also happy with the training Yeah, I liked it. Um, uh, I mean, uh, Sunil has shown a lot of patience in <laughs> answering our questions. Thanks, Sunil. Uh, I mean, I liked it the way you have explained patiently to us. Thanks, thanks. It's always good to hear positive feedback. Yeah. <laughs> I know the subject is kind of very complicated. Uh, like everybody, I must, I am sure, would have tried to understand on their own. But this complex, I mean, this. attacks our basic fundamentals about how we have been used from our childhood about transactions and financials so it's not an easy concept to first understand and i'm going to explain i know it's very difficult so i liked it the way you have explained thank you i think uh, two people have left the uh, meeting Yeah, I think Rajiv. Um, I left the meeting. He 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 asked that if he can send this video so that he can sure, sure, hear it sure, offline. Sure. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I'm not sure about the uh, other person. So I think yeah, either from my point of view, I also um, like this. So 
I think at least three uh, percent have confirmed. And let's see uh, about the other people. We can check it uh, offline. I'm not sure if Pankaj or uh, other people is also here, and they would like to say anything. So I have Sharad and Sunil Pathak as confirmed. Who is the third person? Vinay was the Vinay was the third person. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So if mm -hmm. Pankaj, KK, and uh, Opal, if you can, if you think you have made your decision now, let us know. Uh, otherwise, you know, you can let us know later uh, by 5 p.m. your time. But if you have made your decision, you can let us know now. It'll be easier. We can uh, send out the payment links and all that. And uh, because tomorrow we have to start early, uh, we're moving to 6:30 a.m. your time. It'll, it'll just help us in the logistics and stuff. Yeah. And by the way, Saraj ji is our leader here. He is conducting all these things, so he will let you know all the details. Okay. okay. Yeah, Sridhar. Yeah, we'll coordinate and we'll let you know. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thanks a lot. Could you drop now? All right. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. Guys. Guys. Thank you guys. Okay. Bye. Have a nice. Good bye. night. Bye. Bye. Have a nice bye, -bye. Day. India. Yeah. So. India, thank you.